right, it is Friday afternoon in General Housing and Military Affairs, and we have a really um, special treat this afternoon. We are going to be talking about um, housing as a vaccine, and we have with us, and we're also going to hear a report from um, Dartmouth College uh, did a report on housing and what we did in, in the face of the pandemic last year in terms of housing the homeless and really working on programs, and they 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 studied it and um, have some thoughts that they wanted to share with us. And so we invited them in. But first, I really want to, it takes me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Megan Sandell um, from Boston. Um, are you still affiliated with Boston University? Yep, Boston University, Boston Medical Center. Absolutely. Great. College for the Arts, 83. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I, um, uh, I had the pleasure of seeing uh, Dr. Sandel when she came up to uh, Vermont seven years ago now. Yeah. And um, I just realized as we've been discussing about the homelessness issues that no one on this committee was here except me. Um, and so when I've talked about housing as a vaccine or housing as healthcare, it's become part of the, no the, 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 the language, but it really had its start for me back in 2014 when I heard you speak. And so I'm just gonna pass the microphone to you. You're, you've been made a co-host. Um, so if you have a slide deck that you wanna show us, it's all yours, um, but really uh, just welcome you to, um, Bert, um, I'm sorry, to um, remote Vermont. Um, we were having a semantic conversation earlier today about the difference between virtual and remote. And we are remote, we are real, um, we are not virtual. And so welcome to, welcome to our committee. And awesome. um, please, the microphone is yours. Great. Well, uh, first, thank you so much for inviting me. I think um, uh, for those that don't know, I went to medical school at Dartmouth. So I did many of my rotations in White River Junction and just um, have a, a huge amount of um, uh, fond memories of being in that part of the world. And then I, I definitely am excited to kind of be able to kick off what is going to be a really cool hearing. You guys are going to hear an amazing report. Um, and I just want to kick it off with just some overview thoughts. And then uh, I'll stick around for some questions. I'm sorry, I won't be able to stay the whole time. Um, but you have me until 1.30. So I am going to share my screen if I can figure it out and um, uh, start us off uh, with just some overview. Let's see. All right. Can people see my screen? Thumbs up? Yes. OK, great. Um, so uh, one of the things that I think is interesting, and, and this has really increased a lot in the last seven years, is people talking about how social factors drive health outcomes. Um, I will say that like when I first started doing this work, honestly, um, uh, you know, two decades ago, I graduated from Dartmouth in 1996 um, from the medical school, is, is that this idea that a social determinant of health mattered as much as as what we tend to think of as like biologic um, factors. And I think that now you don't have to describe why housing and health are related. People see the connection. Um, but I do think that it's important to just name kind of three ways in which I think we sometimes miss the nuance of how social factors drive health outcomes. Um, I think the first is we tend to separate them into individual interventions, right? You're doing a housing intervention, or you're doing a food intervention, or you're doing an educational intervention. And I think that we have to understand that these social factors are interrelated, that, that oftentimes when you do um, something around housing and food together, you can be more synergistic. And so I do think one of the cool things that you guys did in COVID response was you were really multifactorial. And I want to applaud you for that. I think that that means why you were so much more effective um, and why your case rate and your infection rate in the state are so much lower than other states. Um, I think the second is, is that we tend to think of them individually instead of system wide and thinking about systems and policies. And so again, you're, the ability to think beyond just an individual level intervention, but starting to think about system change, I do think becomes really important. Um, the last thing is that there are a lot of historical reasons why certain groups have worse housing outcomes. 
you know, histories of redlining and systematic um, uh, disinvestment in certain communities. And so it's going to take a while to undo those. And we should put kind of an equity lens on it. I'll kind of end with the kind of an equity concept. But I think that idea of not splitting things apart, thinking about multifactorial together, thinking on a system change, I think is really important. Um, uh, the, the next thing is I'm just going to share with you some research. Um, I am a pediatrician, but I'm also a researcher, and I'm part of a, a network called Children's Health Watch. And uh, Children's Health Watch was founded uh, over 20 years ago by a group of pediatricians who were really worried about a policy change that was coming, which was welfare reform. And we're treating already kids with failure to thrive. And now we're really concerned about how was this policy going to potentially change the outcomes of young children and their families. And so um, what started with mostly focused on food insecurity now also looks at other common hardships, right? Like housing instability, energy insecurity, healthcare cost trade-offs, and the health and development of both kids and their parents. And so what's interesting is we started to look at how three forms of unstable housing were associated with the health and development of both caregivers and their children. And so this is kind of a wonky slide. Um, for those that want to get the wonky um, report, I'm happy to send you the article in Pediatrics in February of 2018. But what we looked at was we looked at three forms of housing instability. The green bar you can see here is multiple moves. So that's where we asked someone, how many places had you lived in the past year? And if you answered three or more, it implied you had moved twice at least. Um, the purple bar is that we asked, were you behind on your rent in the past year? And then the blue bar was reporting that you had been homelessness, you had been homeless in the lifetime of the young child, a child zero to four. And so what you'll see here is the red bar is that you answered no to all three of those. And then what we did is we kind of stacked up the adjusted odds ratios, like the likelihood of reporting that your child was in fair or poor health or the likelihood of reporting that the mother was in fair or poor health, or that the mother was having depressive symptoms, or that the family was reporting food insecurity at the household level, or that you were reporting not seeking health care or avoiding purchasing medication because of fear of costs. And so what's striking here is that I think we knew that homelessness was bad, right? That blue bar, right? 50% increased risk of fair or poor health, 100% increased of fair or poor health in the mother, 200% increase of it in maternal depression, fourfold increase in food insecurity, fourfold increase in healthcare cost trade offs. What shocked us was the families that were behind on rent, that purple bar, looked just as bad. And so, as we're thinking about this upstream approach, I think it's really important for us not just to talk about ending homelessness, but we have to talk about ending housing instability if we are gonna be able to achieve that full kind of housing vaccine concept of being able to be healthy. Um, I think the key here is that where can we see the cost savings in the system? And so I don't have to tell you guys, you, you already are utilizing, you know, University of Vermont has been utilizing being able to help homeless patients go to a respite or a, a housing motel as a way to reduce healthcare costs. This is data from Boston Medical Center where we looked at our um, Medicaid members in our accountable care organization and the top 3% of people that used 40% of the dollars, right? When we looked at that top 3% group, half of them were homeless and housing unstable. And so they were just cycling in and out of our emergency department and our inpatient unit. Um, and so I think it's really important to think about healthcare costs, but I also want us to start thinking about two generational costs and that there can be ways in which we can actually look at costs, not just in the individual level, but for everyone living in the household and thinking about it, not just in terms of avoided you know, healthcare utilization, physical health, but also mental health improvement and potentially educational improvement among children. And so you remember that bar graph that I showed you two slides ago. We actually at Children's Health Watch took that, that published paper and then tried to model 
what would be the avoided costs among families with young children over a 10 year time period if everyone had a stable home? And so we conservatively estimate that we think there are $111 billion of avoided healthcare costs for mothers and children related to unstable homes. And we, we kind of estimate that related to particularly the costs of hospitalizations, ambulatory visits, dental, mental health care, medications among the parent, and then also those savings among children, including special education costs. And so being able to think holistically around all the, because I think this is what's hard in budgets, right? Is that you always are thinking about one side of the equation and it's harder to think about the other. But I think there are ways in which you can start to think holistically um, as you can get upstream. And so within this approach, I think that we oftentimes emergently help people. That's the downstream approach, right? With disease and injury and stabilization. But what are the ways in which we can move upstream to prevent those costs? What are the ways in which you can start to move from emergency stabilization to permanent supportive housing and being able to link together the capital, the operating subsidies, the service costs in ways that I think can be really revolutionary. Um, this is my last slide and then I'm gonna unshare so that I can see everyone again and then I'm happy to answer questions. But I think that oftentimes we talk about treating everyone equally and that's really important, no doubt about it. But I think we need to start talking about treating everyone equitably. And so this is my, my favorite diagram. There are a lot of different diagrams about the difference between equality and equity. Um, people have seen the ones probably with the kids walk, uh, watching the baseball game or other things, but I like this one because I think it's pretty simple to understand is that if you have people that start from different places, they're, they're different heights in this kind of uh, um, diagram and you treat them all the same, you give them one box to stand on, only the tallest person gets to that apple of opportunity in the tree. If you treat people equitably, you give them what they need to be successful. You give the tall person one box, you give the medium high person two boxes, you give the shorter person three boxes, then they all get that same fair shot. So the tension here is, is that um, in order to get people equitably to the same fair shot, you have to treat them unequally. You need to give some people more. And, and you have to feel okay about that because we know that people didn't start from different places by accident. We know systemic racism and oppression and how our economic systems are designed are part of the issue. And so in order to change that situation, we have to design an equitable system, not an equal system. And we have to be able to think upstream and not just downstream. And I really think you guys in Vermont have all the ingredients to show this is possible. And so I'm really excited. I'm going to stop my share and get to see everyone now. And, and I would love to be able to answer questions. I'll start by unmuting myself. Um, thank you. And I, when you started off, you talked about the combination, how it fits together and how often policy simply is trying to deal with problems that come up. And I just, you know, just even there, you see in homelessness, I mean, for us, homelessness, affordable housing, but then there's food insecurity. Um, you know, I, in your bar chart, I, I don't think I'd seen maternal depression listed, but of course it is, you know, whether it's, and, and fatherly, I mean, but just the, the stress of being behind on rent um, and who that falls onto, of course, um, um, trying to raise children when you're in poverty uh, is, is, is difficult. So seeing what I'm seeing and what you're, what, what you're studying is just that all of it. And, and that's what I heard before is that, but housing and, you know, when the, when COVID hit, the, the phrase that came to mind immediately for all of us is that if you're going to have a stay at safe home order, you have to have homes to stay at safe, to stay safe in. And that was kind of our, you know, mantra when we did our work. Um, so what I would say is I tell you that diagram I showed you at the end, I say that that first box is always where you're living. And it's not to suggest that that's sufficient alone, right? It's not in a lot of cases. You need to start with a safe, stable, decent home that you can afford, that you're not making trade-offs between food and rent or food and heat or other things. So that's the foundation. 
And then for certain people, you need to build the next layer up, right? You need to be able to get that job with the right, you know, childcare. You need to get that right um, uh, different types of access. And, and an equitable system is able to design that. I think your challenge is you've shown it's possible to create that ecosystem. Now, how do you sustain it over time? How do you use the federal government is going to send you dollars? How do you create the right long-term plan to be able to have that equitable system? And I think you will reap those benefits. And how do you capture that over time? I see that uh, Rep. Rep. Triana. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Um, welcome, and uh, it's good to see you here and, um, and get this information. <clears throat> you know, I guess my uh, my question is, how do we move into this? How do we take all of this information and and this and and, and everything that you're uh, presenting, and how do we move into this? You you comment that we are doing well, but we're not there yet. It's obvious. And we can't build our way out of this dilemma here in Vermont. And we've learned that as well. So, you know, what's the transition look like in your opinion? Yeah, I think that that is a great question. I think in a lot of ways, um, part of it is as we think about stable housing, I tend to think about it as a three-legged stool. And I think of it as that you need the, the spaces to have it and, and thinking creatively about what those spaces look like, you know, whether or not it's, um, you have led the way in converting hotels into thinking about longer term housing. Um, I think office space is gonna be another thing that's gonna change and how, what, what real estate do you have available to you that could be there? Um, I think the second pillar or the second leg of the stool is, um, is operating subsidies, whether they're rental vouchers or other other opportunities. How do you convert those, what sometimes are shelter dollars, how do you convert that to be more about a long-term operating subsidy? Um, there are certain um, federal subsidies that I think are underutilized called like Section 811 vouchers that are designed for people with disabilities. Um, uh, that, that is the part of the federal government that's increasing. Section 811 has seen increases, bipartisan increases in, in housing, um, along with other Section 8 vouchers. But then some states are doing their own voucher programs, right? Massachusetts has a Massachusetts rental voucher program. Like, how do you create that operating subsidy to pay the rent? And then the third piece is most people need some type of wraparound services. And so what are the ways in which you look at your, um, uh, you know, people call it like, we call it Department of Children and Families. Some people call it Department of Social Services. How do you look at that for families? How do you look at um, uh, other homeless services? How do you look at, honestly, a lot of medical services are, are you know, navigators, community health workers. How do you pool all of those services so they're not duplicating, they're efficient? And then, how, so how do you make that three-legged stool work? And, and I think if you can think creatively about what spaces in real estate, not just residential, but office, how do you think through the operating subsidy? How do you think about the services? Um, I, that's how you create the braided funding in order to sustain this over time. Just uh, one more comment quickly that I try and, uh, but, uh... 45 years ago, up here in the Northeast Kingdom, I was a field supervisor for one of the first weatherization programs in the state. And I remember, I mean, 45 years ago doesn't seem like that long ago, but it seems like an eternity because the homes that I visited were so terrible, so bad, and the living conditions that people were living in were so bad. And my recollection is they were all very unhealthy. They suffered from long-term diseases. They suffered from uh, diabetes, obesity. I mean, all of these things and, you know, nutrition was bad. And so, you know, poverty is, is you know, at the root of, of so much of this. Um, and as we know, mental health and uh, substance use also uh, plays into it. But it just, it's just a recollection I have as uh, yeah. listening to you and, uh, and recalling the, the ill health that people who uh, had that people had in, in really poor housing. Yeah, no, that is exactly how I got interested in housing as a pediatric intern was I was treating kids in the ICU for asthma. And I ended up asking a 
a family just like what had changed and they talked about getting a cat and they got a cat because of mice and they couldn't get they couldn't make the change and i it was like a eureka moment for me where i was like oh my god the prescription i want to write is for a healthier home and that's not stocked at the pharmacy right and so and that's where this idea of like housing is a vaccine it keeps you healthy now and in the future comes out and it's not that I think we should medicalize all of this language. It's a little bit of like a trick around kind of getting you excited about it. But but you're a hundred percent right. Like let's think about all the different opportunities. Could you do weatherization to make a home healthier? And that gives somebody a job potentially in in the community. So let's use some of those job training dollars. That's what they've done in North Carolina as a way to get to really badly disinvested in housing is they've created job training programs that teach people how to fix houses. And so then you're able to tap into other different USDA rural dollars, rural housing dollars in order to make that work. Thank you. Representative Bloomley. Yeah, uh, this is great. Um, I, I really appreciate your, your presentation. Um, Dr. Sindel, and I think that I, you know, we talk about uh, the problems of siloing things, siloing services or issue areas, and we do it in the legislature, we, you know, uh, we do it in state government, we do it as nonprofits, I mean, it's just, it's hard, it's, it's hard, thinking through systemic approaches to change is is very difficult. And so I'm wondering where you think the biggest disconnects are systemically. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think, um, you know, one of the things that I think is the hardest to do is to have data talk to each other. Um, because what happens is that oftentimes the family that um, the school is worried about the family that the Department of, of State Children and Families is worried about, the, the, the family that a family practitioner or a health system is worried about are the same families. Like what I sometimes say is like, I think our knee jerk reaction is always to say, let's get somebody another social worker or let's get someone another service provider. When I say like the families that I, are the highest risk families for me, they do not need another case manager. They have plenty of case managers. What they need is a coordinated system. And so I think oftentimes we don't spend enough time on um, data systems so that we can create those shared case lists so that we deduplicate a lot of effort. And that's where I think some efficiencies can be found, honestly. Um, uh, we have been trying to do more like co-navigation as a way to bridge across silos um, in a way where like, oh, um, so for instance, like we have been administering a lot of the federal dollars for back rent, right? Because there's like actually dollars available to pay back rent. But what we're finding is, is that typically when you just give someone the application, it takes about 45 days to get the application and the check to the landlord. But if we have a co-navigator, somebody who's trusted by the family, who knows the family, helping the worker fill out the application, we can get that down to 21 days, right? So like, that's pretty real to like get someone through the system faster. And so I would, I would just make sure that, that you have data systems that work together. I think you guys have done this with SASH, right? Like where you've been able to think about some home-based services related to Medicare and regionalization, like, like you've actually done this. Like I point to Vermont as an example. I wish we had SASH in Massachusetts. Um, I'm trying to get SASH in Massachusetts, but I think this, I, I, I would focus on making sure that you find the silo efficiencies by trying to get data systems to talk to each other. That's the first step before you then do the program planning, before you create the quality improvement. Well, I'm going to be mindful of your time um, here at 128. I, I do want to say I appreciate you showing that last slide about equity. Equity is one of those um, everybody looks at that picture differently, and and um, but it does really paint the picture of well, everybody you know if it's equality, everybody should be able to get by with the same thing, as opposed to well, you know these people need a little bit more in order to make it equitable, and that's. Um, 
that's really, at, we could probably philosophize on that for quite some time, um, the differences between that. But I, I, any final words for us? I mean, I just, I wish we could have you for Well, listen, the day. making it virtual so I don't drive five hours is awesome. So I can come back anytime. And then um, I will say, I, I'm, I'm sorry I can't stay to listen. The Dartmouth report and the Vermont Legal Aid report are great. So like, I'm, I'm excited for you guys to hear more from the authors and then um, yes, whatever I can do to be helpful as you guys think about this journey. In many ways, if Vermont is successful, then I get to use that in Massachusetts and in other states. So um, please uh, let me know how I can stay in touch. Earhart can obviously find me anytime. And, um, uh, but thank you so much for the opportunity today. You guys are amazing. Uh, happy Friday and uh, good luck with the rest of your hearing. Great, thank you. Thank you guys. Bye -bye. Thank you. That story about the house, you know, and the mouse, you know, that really kind of, it, you know, gets it. Just keep asking that one more question um, and maybe you'll get a different answer uh, is, is really at the heart of what our work is. Um, so Anne Sawson, uh, Elizabeth Carpenter Song, Mary Ellen Griffin and Mareta Riley, welcome. I don't know if you have a planned, uh, uh, line up here, so I'll just turn the microphones over to you. I see that see that um, some of you have been named co-hosts, so if you have slides that you want to show, feel free to chime in, but um, I will just let you four figure out who needs to talk next for the next little bit. Thanks. Welcome. Thank you so much, everyone, um, for inviting us uh, to join you today. We have slides um, that we'll share right now, um, and I believe I'm not able to share yet. All right, let's see. Oh, it is, it's working now. Okay, there you go. Um, so just as Dr. Sandel said um, that housing is a vaccine um, in our work, um, we seek to demonstrate that housing is health. Um, and we'd like to talk to you a little bit about what Vermont did and how it can build on its success in using housing policy um, as a tool for addressing other health challenges in this state. Um, just to introduce myself and others that are part of the team, I'm Ann Sassen. I'm one of the co-leads on research on COVID-19 and rural health equity, along with Elizabeth Carpenter Song. And we're joined um, with Mary Ellen Griffin and Mairead O'Reilly from Vermont Legal Aid um, today. Um, as you know, um, Vermont has led the U.S. in its response to the COVID-19 pandemic um, and use of policy has been a critical and often underappreciated component of its, the state's approach in responding to the pandemic. The, Vermont enacted one of the country's most comprehensive eviction moratoriums, uh, provided rental relief for landlords, expanded its motel voucher program to house its homeless population, and has had a moratorium on utility shutoffs. As Dr. Sandel has said, we've known for a very long time in public health that housing is a tool for advancing population health. Um, we know that housing is a key social determinant of health and there's a really strong base of evidence linking housing to a broad range of health conditions, including other infectious diseases, respiratory illnesses, diabetes, heart disease, substance use disorder, uh, and mental health. Um, we, in our work, also use the framing of health equity. We believe that if we're going to address these um, persistent health disparities, then we need to devote disproportionate resources um, to these challenges. Um, in COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic has really foregrounded the relationship between housing health in, in, in a wide range of ways. We know that housing, along with occupational status, is one of the two key risk factors for COVID-19. Um, across the country, we see over and over again that COVID-19 has concentrated in congregate living settings, including nursing homes pris in prisons, um, in multi-generational households, and in crowded housing. housing. Household crowding is much more important than neighborhood density or urban rural status. And this is something that's often underappreciated. Even in our rural context in Vermont, housing is one of the key risk factors for COVID-19. And this comes out very strongly in early data from the state. Across the country, there's growing evidence of the importance of housing policy in controlling COVID-19. States that maintain their eviction moratoriums after the federal moratorium lapsed had lower rates of infections than those that maintained theirs. 
And there's also a growing recognition that housing represents a primary tool of pandemic control, not something that's secondary or just useful for protecting vulnerable populations, but something that's really important for controlling overall transmission rates at, at population level. Um, in Vermont, as you know, um, housing um, support for our homeless population has been critical in the, protecting our most vulnerable Vermonters. Elsewhere across the country, um, the uh, congregate shelters saw prevalence of up to 66%. Um, Vermont, to our knowledge, has seen less than six cases, it's less than 10 cases of COVID-19. Elizabeth? Thank you, Anne, and thank you all for the opportunity to share our work with the committee today. As Anne mentioned, um, we co-lead research and educational programs at Dartmouth that are focused on issues of health equity, particularly in rural communities within the United States. And as part of this work in March of last year, we launched a study um, that aimed to examine the impacts of the pandemic on uh, rural health systems and communities in Vermont and New Hampshire. And to date, we've been able to conduct interviews with over 80 stakeholders. Um, and these stakeholders represent uh, many different sectors, including health systems leaders, healthcare providers, um, members of social service organizations and housing programs, mutual aid groups, town and city governments, and schools. We really wanted to cast our net wide in terms of documenting in real time the impacts of the pandemic. And throughout this process, we've asked our stakeholders to describe what they saw as the key challenges and areas of need, as well as their perspectives on opportunities um, as they look ahead in their own work and within their own communities. And our goal in this work is to identify key priorities for action, as well as policy. Next slide, Anne. And so I just wanna highlight um, a few of the key findings that I think are particularly relevant to our discussion today. And throughout the study, we've heard from stakeholders that housing and homelessness are major areas of need and concern in the region. And this is something that very early on, um, the pandemic revealed the scale of housing insecurity in Northern New England communities. And this is something that I think largely has remained hidden um, particularly in many rural communities. And this is um, something that has become much clearer as many individuals and families who had previously been doubled up with other households as a survival strategy, that was no longer a tenable strategy for them given the need to social distance at that point. And so what we saw and what we heard from our stakeholders is that there were many people and families who became newly homeless as this strategy of doubling up was no longer tenable for them. We've heard from our stakeholders that um, the expanded access to the GA motel program was something that was a crucial adaptation for protecting a vulnerable population. And as Anne had mentioned, this was noted throughout our interviews as something that was key in averting the poor, how, the poor outcomes that have been seen elsewhere um, in populations experiencing homelessness. It's also the case that within the context of some of these short-term uh, supports and in the context of these programs, this really facilitated um, some to access social services, mental health and behavioral services, and to take some initial steps to achieve um, permanent housing security. And so I think this is something that needs to be brought to light and really celebrated. And as we think about it, to build on this as an opportunity um, to, to think about the service connections that have been established within the context of, uh, of these programs as a way to support long-term the health and social needs of vulnerable Vermonters. Um, and, and finally, just a, you know, something that has emerged as a consistent refrain um, throughout our interviews is that um, there is significant unmet need um, for housing. And so um, the, the need for additional housing units, um, the need for uh, affordable housing units, uh, 
particularly the, the need, as Dr. Sandel was noting, the need for supportive housing and those types of wraparound services are really crucial, as well as improvements to existing housing stock and what we were just talking about in terms of thinking about weatherization and things of that nature um, to address some of the, the poor housing um, that, is, that is a part of our communities here in Vermont. Next slide, Anne. And so through our research, we've identified uh, three policy priorities. The first is to maintain uh, the pandemic housing protections to address the immediate needs for housing and security within Vermont. The second is to expand uh, supportive housing and those wraparound services. And finally, the need to invest in significant expansion and improvement of affordable housing within the region. And so we've, we are delighted to have partnered um, with our friends in uh, Vermont Legal Aid to translate our findings into actionable policy recommendations. And I'm gonna turn things over now to Mary Ellen Griffin, who will describe uh, in more detail the policy priorities and recommendations. Thank you. And thank you to the committee for having us. It's really great to be here. I also just wanna say thank you for what you've been able to accomplish so far in terms of keeping Vermonters safe, safely housed during this pandemic. It is really, really amazing what Vermont has done in this situation. And um, it's just really worth taking a look at it and saying thank you for that. Um, the eviction moratorium that was enacted by the legislature has been rated very highly by all experts. I think we're ranked fifth in the country for how effective our eviction moratorium has been. It has worked to really reduce the rate of eviction, especially eviction into homelessness. The eviction filings had been at about 150 a month and they went down to 50. Um, the eviction moratorium, which I, I always think of as the eviction moratorium, it also extends to foreclosure. At the moment, it's not addressing um, property tax issues, which is still a problem, but it's, it's huge in terms of keeping people housed. Um, a crucial part of the eviction moratorium was the back rent program. The rental housing stabilization program supported almost 10,000 households to um, stay housed and to keep those landlords in business. The one criticism that experts make about our moratorium is that it, it sort of has a sudden end. When the, when the emergency comes to an end, um, the eviction moratorium and the foreclosure moratorium will end. There's not really a soft landing there. There's just, and we don't know, even though the eviction filings have gone down, we don't know how many people have waited to file the evictions until the moratorium ends. So there is a risk that we're gonna see a surge of evictions when the state of emergency ends. Um, next slide, please, Ann. The other really crucial part that everybody has mentioned um, is the GA Motel program. Um, the short-term housing protections that this allowed um, brought greater stability for many people, not just people who are, uh, who are facing homelessness, but it meant that it kept our rates low. So we almost doubled the number of people that were using emergency shelter. The GA Motel program started off in March. You can see on the chart on the right, if you can see those tiny numbers at about 200 and it, it went up to almost um, over 1,800 households by uh, this month, by last month. Um, the other issue that the motel program faced was that it was hard for people to move out. People couldn't find permanent homes. So the length of time, which had already been at a record high before the pandemic, went has gone even for even higher because people, some people have, but very few people have been able to find permanent homes to live in. And next slide, please. Um, I think keeping those two main um, immediate housing protections in place during the pandemic are really crucial. They've really worked to keep people housed or at least stably sheltered during the pandemic. And we've really seen the results in terms of reduced numbers of COVID. But as we keep those in place, um, I think as Representative Stephen said, it's like a pilot project. Which pieces of this can we keep? How can we keep some measure of this housing security moving forward? Um, I mean, there's a lot of ideas to explore. There are other ways to reduce the eviction rate. We have the federal money for the back rent program for the next year, and that's huge, but can we have a back rent program that's gonna extend past there? Could there be other housing support programs? Um, I think it was Dr. Sandell who talked about the SASH program. That's really helpful in helping people who are having conflict with their landlords, figure out solutions to resolve those conflicts and stay housed. The right to counsel for people to navigate through the eviction process if that happens. 
the right to shelter, the way the GA motel program has worked is been sort of like a right to shelter. Everybody who needed a safe place to, to stay has been able to get a safe place to stay. As the state starts to talk about ending the GA motel program and moving to a different system, do we wanna still say, no, we're gonna make sure nobody sleeps outside, nobody's sleeping in a tent or in a condemned building. Everybody who needs a bed will get one. Um, we should also look at programs to preserve low income home ownership. The mortgage assistance program Delinquent property taxes is definitely something that legal aid, it's stressful to see people lose their homes over owing a relatively small amount of back taxes. Um, next slide, please. Our second priority that Elizabeth and Anne through their research have identified is to expand supportive housing. We have the roadmap to end homelessness. The Roadmap to End Homelessness is a report that was put together by a coalition of state agencies, nonprofits, housing experts that mapped out how, what we would do to end homelessness. It's from 2017, but it's still very relevant and still provides detailed instructions as to how to end homelessness. The graph on the right is, um, is actually from that report. It's a little outdated, but it, it, the same principles apply in terms of how much money we could save by taking people making sure that everybody who needs permanent supportive housing can get it. Oops. Um, thanks, Anne. So um, the, the supportive services, as Dr. Sandel mentioned, the three, the three legs of the stool, that the three legs of the stool are the bricks and mortar, the subsidy for the housing, and then building supportive services into the design of the housing. Those services, especially from the research that Anne and Elizabeth have done, really need to be focused on the fact that people have different needs. There are different populations that we're housing in the GA motel program right now, and those people, people have different needs. So some of the different groups would be thinking of newly homeless versus the chronically homeless, families with children, people who have mental health or other health needs, and people with substance use challenges. People in those different categories with, with those different challenges have different needs, so the services would need to be different. Next slide, please. And then the last is that really, the, as, as Dr. Sandel said, housing is foundational. And the foundation for this is that we need more affordable housing. That the difference between what people can afford and what rents are being charged has just gotten further and further and further apart. Before the pandemic, the housing needs assessment showed that there that 18,000 households in Vermont were spending more than half of their income on housing and 36,000 were spending more than 30%, which is what the rule of thumb is to say whether it's affordable. The housing needs assessment said we needed 2,629 more units of affordable housing by 2025. There were new housing units created with the coronavirus relief funds. I'm sure this committee knows better than me, but between the Vermont Housing Conservation Board program that created 247 units and the um, Housing Recovery Program, uh, which touched, I think, 253 units I'm hearing. So that was about 500 units, but we still need way more units of affordable housing. Um, next slide, please. The research also shows sort of two important things to think about in developing the affordable housing. One is that Quality of affordable housing obviously matters. And Dr. Sandel spoke to this very eloquently. Um, I think this is more an issue in the private market than in the, the government subsidized housing, but in the private market, a lot of the affordable housing is really still unsafe. I heard what Representative Troyana talked about, about visiting places in the Northeast Kingdom, and that's my service area. And there still are places that are just in really, really bad shape. People living in condemned buildings with no heat source, with out running water with other people's plumbing waste coming up into their homes regularly, lots of mold. So addressing those issues would really move the ball forward in terms of making more safe, affordable housing available. The second is that the location of affordable housing also matters for health. Um, again, this Dr. Sandel spoke to this eloquently when she talked about the historic problems that we're still working through in terms of housing, but in Vermont, I think another real issue is the rural nature of our communities and the transportation issues that are involved, especially for people with low income. So situating affordable housing 
where near jobs and services with good transportation really matters and makes it more valuable and useful to people that are exiting homelessness particularly. Um, next slide, please, Anne. So I, I'm, I'm with Dr. Sandel and, and all the other speakers that I do think Vermont really has a chance to, to take the lead here and demonstrate to the country how to end homelessness. Um, what Vermont has been able to do during the pandemic has been really incredible. And I think that it's been more obvious to people outside of this room that housing um, is connected to health, that people who weren't ever involved in these issues can see that keeping people housed really helped to keep our numbers low in COVID. Um, we have a chance to come out of this stronger and healthier by really building on the housing stability we've created through this pandemic. So that's my whole presentation. Thank you very much. Representative Trano. Yes, I just wanted to mention that we had heard from the uh, Vermont Housing Finance Agency uh, earlier this year um, to, uh, as of note, to um, people who are uh, having difficulty with their financing on their homes, um, that property taxes were considered and that the finance agency did take on property tax arrears as part of trying to keep people in their homes. So that was a good move. It's fairly limited, but it, it does exist. At, at the last one of the last points you made, um, Mary Ellen, was important in our conversation because the idea that we can create more housing or buy more motels. I mean, that was that was what we did last year as we bought up motels, not you know, however many we did. But the idea of segregation is really goes against the nature of the kind of goals we've had for affordable housing for the 30, 40 years that we've been really concentrating on it. I'm just curious to know what you might see. Um, I mean, I appreciate that we're leaders in this, so maybe we don't have comparisons per se, but you know, how do we avoid, um, how do we avoid providing, I mean, so much new housing in such a way that either it can be built safely and that it doesn't segregate people out like the projects of the 60s, you know, 50s and 60s did. Um, where, do we, where do we find that conversation um, to make sure that we don't, it, so make sure we don't slip into that trap. Anne or Elizabeth, do you want to answer that? I, I'm, go ahead. No, no, please go ahead, Mary Ellen. I mean, I think it's definitely a challenging issue. I think one of the things that we've seen in the pandemic is that having people in the motels made it a lot easier to deliver services because people were centralized. But having people centralized also created its own set of problems that we know having people spread in the community um, and, and, and sort of, it, it's challenging because so I think part of it is what the research is showing about the need for heterogeneous, to sort of address heterogeneous populations that different people are gonna need different kinds of services. So we need a bunch of different kinds of affordable housing. Some people just need affordable housing. Their real problem is they're poor, they can't afford their rent, they need a place they can afford. Some people need a place that has mental health services right there on the spot or substance abuse services or different kinds of services for them there. Um, and we're gonna need different kinds of affordable housing spread across the state. Transportation is a really difficult issue. Um, people, a lot of people really want to stay in their home community. One of my one of the places I work is in Newport, and I definitely hear that a lot from our continuum of care, that there are people who are in really bad housing situations, but they don't want to come to St. Johnsbury. They don't want to go to Barrie. They're going to stay in their really dangerous housing situations to stay in their community. So having more services spread around the state so that people can stay in their community while getting the support and housing they need is really important. I don't know if Anne or Elizabeth, you want to add to that, or Maraid. I would just add to that too, in terms of you know building on um, you know, our earlier discussions of thinking holistically and and thinking 
you know, with with systems, you know, that as we're as we're thinking about the affordable housing issue, to take into account location, to take into account, I think a principle of really thinking about building healthy communities, right? And so and and thinking about diversity within those communities and thinking about socioeconomic diversity within those communities. Um, certainly what we have seen historically over time throughout the US is a move toward greater residential segregation, in fact. And so I think we have an opportunity here to potentially disrupt that trend, you know, and, and be thinking about the critical factors for us as a rural state, of course, transportation, as Mary Ellen's pointing to, and, and being close not only to, to services as we think of health and social services, but other resources that all of us enjoy, being close to town centers for libraries and other types of resources that are all about the health and well being of our individuals and families. Representative Triano, do you have another? I just uh, thinking in terms of St. Johnsbury, where, um, you know, in the 19, early 1970s or late 1960s, I guess it was, that uh, what was known as Moomite Ridge was built. It was a low income housing project five miles out of town. And, you know, most of the people there had no transportation. And they were, you know, you would see people walking that distance into town or calling cabs that they can't afford. So it is actually um, right now um, uh, encouraging to see that the latest uh, uh, project, housing project in St. Johnsbury is a downtown project with the new Avenue Hotel, Rural Edge is putting that in, 40 units of affordable housing. Um, and it's really good to see a little bit of a turnaround in that notion that we don't want these people downtown. A question that comes up when it's when we talk about housing at this um, at this level. I mean, besides you know, from starting from not having housing to um, perhaps transitional or safety housing to getting into affordable units and then and then above, right? And 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 we're really just stepping up the economic ladder when we try to draw it that way. But when we talk about the private apartments that are available, when we hear stories of mold and of of, of really difficult, everything that Marianne described about the, the, dis, the description of, or, uh, of these apartments that may be available and used and, and habited, habitated right now, um, where people don't wanna leave because they don't think they can find a place that's cheaper. What the rehabilitation program we put into effect sort of started to address using state dollars to help private owners. But, how how do you inspire somebody who either can't afford or chooses not to update their apartments and make them safe and still charge the rents that they can charge because of the marketplace? I mean, is there is there um, a magic? It's not magic. I know it's not magic. Um, but has there been a conversation about how do you again? How do you work with with private owners? who think that their apartment's just fine, perhaps. Well, I think there's a bunch of different landlords in that category. And I think it's a very, very small percentage of landlords, right? Most landlords out there are doing a really good job and are maintaining their units. There are a few landlords out there who their business model is renting out substandard apartments, right? Like that's a business model that works for them. Why does it work for them? That's probably a complicated question, but trying to disrupt that and make it less profitable to rent out substandard apartments, I think that would go a long way. That's a challenging task. Um, I mean, I've definitely had frustrating moments where I've seen a landlord get a reduction in their property tax appraisal because the apartment wasn't up to code and then they're still renting it out and deny it. So that, frustrates me, but I, I, it's a challenging question, but I think that's a very small percentage of the landlords. I think there's definitely some landlords out there who don't have the resources to fix up their units. Um, they just don't, they don't have the know-how, they don't have the ability. I think one of the things I get from the social science research and maybe Anne and Elizabeth could speak more, but that one of the ways to combat this is owner occupied units that people who own a fourplex and live in one of the units are more likely to keep it up um, and that that could be an interesting model to pursue but it's um, it's definitely a good question to ask and I don't have a full answer. It's part of our dilemma period you know because you can't just have only affordable on a HUD based system there's not enough money in the world 
to do that. Elizabeth? If I can make one quick plug just for the Rental Housing Advisory Board's recommendations, which was to gather more data, which is one of the things Dr. Sandel said, that if we had more data about where the apartments were and what condition they were in, I think it would make it easier for policymakers to know how to address the problems if we knew where all these problems were. Right now, the town health officer reports are in every town health officer across the state of Vermont's offices. And I can get them by emailing, but it's hard for a policymaker to get a full picture of where are the problems and how widespread are they and how severe are they? Elizabeth? I think that's that's excellent. And I think that, you know, just thinking about building on what Mary Ellen was saying, thinking creatively about what are the, with, with this particular issue, I think, especially, what are the levers of accountability? You know, and that can exist in terms of, I think, owner-occupied buildings is a really interesting one, but other, other things that may also exist at a community level as well um, in terms of creating um, systems of accountability um, and put a little pressure on, on, you know, that subset of landlords with, with that as their business model. Um, we talked about sustainability. Um, again, we know that the money that we were able to allocate to VHCB to help local organizations buy motels or, you know, and, and turn them into micro apartments um, was expensive. I mean, it was, and that money came from the federal government. And we, and we know we have, we, I know we have um, different ways of funding things that might make it a little bit less expensive to the tax, you know, to our tax collection. But um, what, again, is it simply political will? I mean, again, how do we build the resources to be sustainable? We're not going to keep getting federal funding. We know that. Um, I mean, I'm heartened that we have the funds that we have to maybe build a rental program for people at the, at, you know, at the reach up level who can, you know, we might be able to help them with rent for nine months or a year, um, but that's not sustainable. So it's, it, and so finding susten finding a way to do that, how, you know, any words of wisdom for us or any thoughts on that? And that's from the committee too. Um, I mean, I'm really proud of the work we've done, but I understand too that unless there's funding sources, we're not gonna be able to get close to that 2,700 units by 2025. I don't Sorry, know if there's I, any... I didn't mean to be a doggy downer here on, on, a, on the day when we're supposed to be hearing a report about how well we did. Go ahead, Marianne. I, I think one of the interesting points that Dr. Sandel made was that part of the problem is the siloing. So it's hard to capture the cost savings that we see from affordable housing where we're just looking at the housing costs. And I don't know how to do that. I mean, that might, I, I don't even know if that's politically possible to say, okay, well, let's look at how much we save. That chart that I put up about um, the cost of somebody using the emergency room in inpatient hospitalization, if there are some way to capture those costs and say, well, we saved all this money from not having people be so sick and not having people have their mental health, like just go down the toilet. Um, but it's very hard to capture those costs and to try to show that actually this is cheaper. It'd be much cheaper just for people to be stably housed. And, and that chart, as you said, it's, it's a little bit out of date, but not on the, not on the percentage savings. Um, I mean, when the difference between the most expensive bed in the state, which is in a hospital room and, um, and even being in a, you know, the, what it was the bottom chart, you know, $40 a night, or, you know, even in a hotel at $73 a night, it's a far piece of savings from $1,600 or whatever the emergency room cost was. Um, sure. How do you cap, how do you capture the concept of that to make the investment in the lower cost housing, but at the same time, still have to be able to provide emergency funding you know it, for the crisis of the instant and yeah that's our battle that's that's our that's our job john you had your hand up a minute ago well i think we've I, I, i'm heartened by our pandemic response and i think part of the problem lies in our committee structure and what we learned in the pandemic is it worked across committees in an integrated way. 
And uh, I think that we just built on that and no longer think that housing's by itself and human services by itself. And I, I think, Chair, you kind of modeled it with, with Ann Pugh in, in how housing and human services are like, we're in the same conversation now. And we have to make sure that other committees are working like that. And you know, I, I think all the different caucuses we're in is really interesting. And every caucus is looking at bills that are moving through the legislature through that caucus lens. So I think there's a kind of, um, we should take the success that we've had. And I think we may have to budget differently that it may be an appropriations issue um, as, we, as we come to, when we do our reports and stuff. But I, the proof is there in this $85 million we did out of our committee with human services just in the pandemic response. It's been profound to see how the integrated services and last week we learned, you know, the motels were one part, but it just can't be the motels. It had to be all these services. And so, I mean, moving forward, we cannot not include that stuff now. You know, uh, so it's, I'm, I'm heartened by it. I think it's like, wow, this crisis showed us, I think a different paradigm. So I'm, I think it's, it's up to us now, you know, so, and you, you've, you've led it Tom. So I'm, I'm, I'm great about it. I'm, I'm actually excited. Further, um, can, can I actually go back to the beginning um, with Anne and and um, Elizabeth? Can you talk about your affiliation with Dartmouth and what the center is? Because I I had not I had not heard of you, and so if you could just, um, I mean, I I think looking at rural housing, especially during the pandemic, is is huge, but as it, but looking at rural housing is huge, um, regardless because of the lack of investment, the lack the the changing um, nature of small towns when transportation is an issue, and when um, you know is working from home a good thing for small town? I, you know all of these things where um, I mean there are things we're going to see out of the pandemic, but if you, could you just fill us in a, a little bit on on your organization and and how you, how you came to study this, not just Vermont, but this whole topic. Elizabeth, why don't you start? So Anne and I, Anne and I come to the work, um, Anne has a public health background. I am a medical anthropologist by training. And so we've, we've worked as community um, engaged researchers for many years now. Um, what is a medical anthropologist? So I, I like to say that I have one of the best jobs in the world, that I have the privilege of going out and spending time with individuals and families, learning about their everyday lives. And a lot of what I focus on, on um, uh, are partnering with marginalized families, so families impacted by uh, housing insecurity and, um, and mental health issues. And Anne brings a background in particular with uh, global health um, and has recently turned her attention to issues of rural health equity. And so we have come together to really try to think about how we can pull focus um, and generate evidence um, in terms of you know, identifying areas that uh, for action as well as for policy recommendations through the work that we do. Um, we're both affiliated with the Center for Global Health Equity at Dartmouth, which is a, an umbrella organization that brings together um, multiple researchers from across the institution. Anne and I wear multiple hats at Dartmouth um, as well as have partnerships with Dartmouth Hitchcock Health the health uh, system in, uh, in New Hampshire as well. And so we're really trying to pull together um, not only a network of, of researchers, but also community partners and other stakeholders to help us as much as we can learn about what the key needs and priorities are within our region. Um, and we're also interested in, in thinking about how we uh, compare to other regions within rural regions within the US as well. And I would also add that this research that's focused on housing is part of a much larger body of work. Um, our work is by state in nature. So we've been looking at the responses in both New Hampshire and Vermont um, and the ways that um, the pandemic is affecting both rural communities and health systems and housing has emerged as a very critical um, area of focus of this work. Um, but it's, um, you know, we um, have looked much more broadly to understand what's happening across um, the two states. 
And is your research, I mean, I, again, I appreciate this report and this analysis. Um, and is, is this the kind of research that if we weren't in Vermont or New Hampshire, we'd be able to look up and look at and learn from? Is there other material that you're producing that we might be able to find um, nuggets of information that we can use? Absolutely. We've, um, we'd be happy to share with you our um, report that came from our initial phase of research. Um, and we also have um, some, some additional updated reports as well that we'd be delighted to share with the committee. Yeah, and I guess one more question on this for me is, is um, Dr. Sandel talked about, again, the holistic view. And so do you take that? I mean, yes, you're visiting families and you're seeing what's on the, the ground, but are you, you know, I mean, I, I mean, I can just, my brain can just go spinning at, at, you know, well, what do we have for SNAP benefits? What do we have for um, food banks or, you know, availability? What do we have for um, heating oil? Uh, in our in our neck of the woods, what do we have? You know, so seeing it holistically, um, yet we're still in a world that doesn't view it holistically. Um, and and I really appreciate that. And that, and I think that was one of the things that we in our study design tried to really be aware of. Um, and as we thought about who we needed to connect to in the context of conducting interviews in Vermont and New Hampshire, we really cast our net very wide. So we didn't limit ourselves, even though we might be focused on rural health equity, we knew we needed to talk to people who were outside of the healthcare system, outside of being healthcare providers. And so we've had an opportunity to really connect with you know, a, a wide cross section of community members, various um, health and social service organizations to try to document those different pieces of the puzzle. The other thing I would say too is that, I, um, and I think our earlier research really points to the ways in which in both New Hampshire and Vermont, um, the success of collaborations and networks and partnerships in our region. Um, and that was something again that I think we already have some models that we can point to um, in terms of breaking down some of these traditional silos. Um, and so there, I think those would be also some things that may be helpful um, for, the, for the committee to, um, to, to have access to some of the, the research that focuses a bit more broadly than, than just housing as well. That's great. Thank you. And Mary Ellen, your focus is, is up in, you said you're based in Newport or in the kingdom? I work out of the St. John's Bay Office of Legal Aid and I mostly cover um, Caledonia, Orleans and Essex counties. Mostly I've been doing eviction defense. I do a lot of conditions cases as well, but uh, it's been really great to not have so many people evicted. It's just, it's an amazing thing. Um, so. And that's because that's not that's be, I mean what we've heard testimony from is that part of that is because um, perhaps people aren't filing, but more importantly, landlords are getting their back rent, so they're erasing uh, up to upwards of seventy percent of all evictions are supposedly about back rent um, or more. Um, Legal Aid and the Vermont Landlord Association also started a mediation program that hopefully will keep people out of court. Um, and, you know, I, I guess with that, with the moratorium part, I mean, I, I mean, everybody says we, it kind of ends, I mean, it ends in 30 days, um, which I guess is, it may not be a soft landing, but it certainly is softer than, than perhaps not, but it's, you know, it's it's what we were able to um, it's it's what we were able to do with with the administration and with the court system. Um, do I'm you see? Oh, sorry. About no, the moratorium. go ahead. The moratorium has saved lives in Vermont. I, I, it's it's amazing. Uh, it's been really good. It wouldn't have worked without the back rent program, I don't think. But the back. But I think you're right. A lot of problems that we were solving through eviction, we figured out there are other ways we can solve these problems without making vulnerable families homeless. Uh, there, so it'd be great if we could continue some of that, say, okay, these are real conflicts. We need a solution to them, but does it have to involve making somebody homeless? I, I don't think it does. That's not, as, not to the rate that we had been doing it. 
uh, and the report that we we've mentioned it and we haven't said it, but something that Legal Aid did with Landlord Association and other stakeholders was um, was about the existing program. Basically, we do have a background program tucked away somewhere in our in our emergency services division that um, I know several years ago we were trying to increase the funding to it before COVID, and then COVID we were able to do that um, with the CRF funds. But I think as we do our work moving forward, we have to consider, you know, if we can, can fund that. I mean, I'm glad we had this money. I'm glad we're using it, but nevertheless, that was $25 million in back rent in, in six months. Um, that's a substantial amount of money. I don't think the ongoing program would be quite as, as robust, but nevertheless, um, it's almost nice to clear as many plates as we've cleared moving forward. Um, all right. I am um, so grateful that you were able to make time for us. Um, all of you, I, I, I haven't seen Marae for a while, so I'm assuming she's working um, elsewise. Um, Marae, do you have anything to offer? I'm here. I, I um, So I was just on the call to, in, in case there were questions specifically about the GA, um, program, I sort of helped a little bit in, in um, drafting the brief, um, but primarily worked with this group in a couple of the op-eds that came out. Um, and as a medical legal partnership attorney for people with substance use disorder, a lot of the work I've done in the pandemic um, intersects with the GA motel program. So I was just here as sort of backup in case questions came up about that, um, but they didn't. <laughs> Um, no. So it was, it was nice to hear the presentation and, and obviously to hear from Dr. Sandell, um, what an amazing uh, partner in, in this work. All right, well, great. Good to see you all. Um, and again, thank you, Elizabeth, and, and nice to meet you. Um, and um, thank you for your work. Um, I appreciate, um, I, I just appreciate the focus of your work. Uh, it, it is really important to keep to keep knowing what's going on out there. So thank you. Thank you so much. And for this Mary Ellen and Marie, thank, thank you for you. your work. And we'll see you each, I'm sure at some point during the session on, on anything ranging from GA issues to other, other landlord issues. So thank you so much. Um,